This program is brought to you by Stanford University. Please visit us at stanford.edu. This presentation is delivered by the Stanford Center for Professional Development, providing graduate level education to working professionals online, on campus, and on site. For more information, please visit study.stanford.edu. This week we have Andy Wilson from Microsoft Research, uh, moved there from Media Lab, and uh, he's talking on a theme that we've sort of waved our hands at a lot over the years, which is computing beyond the desktop, right? What uh, happens when you move away from the kinds of interfaces we now have? Waving your hands is not a bad metaphor, actually, for some of the stuff he's looking at, because, uh, of course, when you don't have a keyboard and a mouse and all that kind of stuff, the inter interaction becomes a new interesting challenge, I think is one of the developing new areas that we're going to see a lot more of in the next few years. So he'll be talking about some of the projects that he and his colleagues are working on at Microsoft. Thanks, Jerry. So um, I'm at uh, Microsoft Research uh, in uh, Redmond. Um, and uh, I'm in the Adaptive Systems and Interaction group. Um, and that's just a cover, uh, cover name for a bunch of different activities. Uh, we're in, involved in a, a lot of different things. And my little uh, slice of what's going on is really um, uh, what, basically what Terry said, is looking at uh, uh, new computing, new ways of uh, interacting with your computers, uh, say, uh, maybe 10 years or even less, uh, I guess, uh, in the future. And my background is in uh, computer vision, really. That's, that was the, my um, PhD work was in computer vision and gesture recognition and, uh, and various kinds of sensing um, challenges. And so my take on, on um, what's going on with um, uh, future computing form factors is very much uh, embedded in what, I, what we think about uh, sensing. And so sensing technology obviously can uh, enable a lot of different kinds of interaction. You're already familiar with this concept. And I think one of the things that in the, in the near term is really going to um, enable all sorts of interesting kinds of uh, interactive uh, systems is really the, the fact that displays are just getting so much cheaper. And I think that's a really important trend that, that I mean, everyone kind of realizes it, but the, the, just the magnitude and the speed with which a projector, uh, the price of a projector has fallen over the years, and LCD displays and this, this kind of thing, uh, it's really quite breathtaking. And I think what we're going to see is that instead of having just a sort of a one-size-fits-all um, arrangement um, of computing, we're now going to be able to um, embed uh, displays in, in the walls and in, in tabletops and all sorts of other places that we don't normally don't think of as supporting uh, computing. And, um, and the neat thing about it is that, well, because we, everything is so cheap, we don't, we don't necessarily have to be able to read our email on all these devices, right? It's OK if it works substantially differently, right? And so we see this a little bit already with phones, tablet PCs, uh, uh, computers for our living room spaces. Uh, but I think this is a trend that we, that, that's fun to watch. And I think that you know, eventually we're going to have a lot of different kinds of computers in our environment, a lot of different kinds of displays. And sometimes it'll be just fine to have a, w a wall display that's devoted to looking at pictures. I think that's a really fine scenario. And so what I'm going to show you is a couple of different takes on that. I'm not going to show anything like a, um, like a, uh, a full up uh, computational system that you could even browse the web on a lot of, sp a lot of times. But, and the first one I'd like to, to show to you, I'm just going to go right off and I'm going to show a bunch of projects and some video. And um, I like to keep things a little bit informal. So if, if you have a question, uh, just come right out with it. And if there's something you don't really understand, I'm happy to address it on the spot. So the first system, uh, this is a project I've been working on um, for a few years now. It's called Touchlight. And basically, it's, um, I'm just going to hop into this video right away. And um, So yeah, so I've been working on this for a little while. Uh, so this is a transparent projection screen material. This is my office. And uh, we have a couple of cameras, and we have a, um, a video projector beneath it. And as you note, the, this, this pro projection screen material is unique in that it's transparent, yet you can also project onto it. It's actually a, um, a kind of hologram. And it's a commercially available thing. And the, the thing that's neat about it uh, from, from my perspective is the fact that you can see through it with an infrared camera. And so you have this. Um, these, these, these neat things that you can do by just placing a couple cameras, putting an IR uh, pass filter and an inf uh, 
an IR illuminant uh, behind it, and you can actually do uh, these get these kinds of images back. So there's, there are two cameras, and what we're doing here is just warping them, uh, doing this rectification step where it's, uh, we flatten the image and bring it out to the corner so that it's actually in, in display coordinates. And then we combine these two images together to get an idea of what's on the surface. And so it's a little bit like a touch screen in that sense, except you're actually getting an image of what's on the surface rather than, say, just a, a single uh, 2D point. And that's a huge, um, huge um, um, distinction between uh, th these kinds of systems and sort of what you've seen um, in, in, in terms of touch screens before. So this is just a little RD kind of thing. You know, if you graduated from the Media Lab, you do this kind of work uh, <laughs> compulsively. And, uh, but it's a nice kind of thing because it shows you exactly, it, it shows you a little bit about, it reveals a little bit about how it actually works while also doing something kind of fun. So it's a nice thing to show. And it works all the time. Um, looking at ways to take advantage of the fact uh, that the screen is transparent. And that's, that's something I've been thinking about a lot. There's a, there happens to be a third camera back here. If you see, there's this uh, Canon PowerShot camera. So when I hold this magazine up to it, uh, it takes a picture of the, of the um, magazine cover, flips it around when you weren't looking. And then this, it's a nice high resolution um, uh, ca um, scan, right? It's a 1600 by 1200 pixel texture. And so there's this sort of natural interaction that, that, that you can do to manipulate it. You'll, you'll probably note that in a lot of these, these interactions, I'm not actually touching the screen exactly. Um, and that's a consequence of the way the, the way the sensing works. And I can talk a little bit about that later. And to, for some people, that's a, that's a big plus. And for other people, it's actually a, a real problem. It sort of depends. But um, let me talk a little bit about, um, oops, a little bit how, you know, uh-oh. A little bit how this works. So we have this. Um, this is the DNP Hollow Screen. It's usually marketed towards um, retail storefront environments. Maybe you've seen this kind of stuff. And the, one of the neat properties of it is it's actually pretty immune to ambient light because most light just sort of carries on through the surface. Um, a lot of people when they when they um, see touch light for the first time, they're like, "Oh yeah, it's just like that movie by that guy, you know, who you know." And they can't quite come out with it. Um, who is it? Somebody? Yeah, so everybody knows it's Tom Cruise, but they never can remember the name of the movie, which I think is really interesting. <laughs> that I'm not going to play the play this video back, but I mean, you've all seen it. And the, a couple of interesting questions about these kinds of interfaces, like do you really think that you're going to be interacting with computing like this in the future, right? I see a few people shaking their heads, right? It's not convenient. Not convenient? Why is it not convenient? speed that you can enter information into the computer with the keyboard is Ah, but what if I just want to like take a thing and just sort of move it over a little bit, right? I bet I can beat you on if, I, if I'm actually allowed to pick up the object directly, right? This is the whole direct manipulation argument, right? Rather than sort of like trying to futz around with widgets or, you know, God help you, command line. Um, but, but, you know, in this, in, I think this is a very interesting, um, interesting idea. Um, it was actually, uh, there is a lawful um, relationship to, to, to what he's doing and what's happening on the screen. It was actually a, um, um, a small uh, manual written for this system, and it was prototyped by John Underkoffler, who was at the Media Lab. Uh, he didn't do that work while he was there. It was something he did afterwards. But what, it's interesting to note that there, this is actually a real system. I mean, everything was done in post-production. Everything you see in the movie was done in post-production, but the system is real in a sense, and that it makes sense. Um, and there's there are certain vocabulary of gestures. There's a set of interactions that are that are actually plausible, and so um, I think it's a very uh, a nice system to sort of look at for real. Actually, I, I think one of the biggest problems we're going to face with these kinds of uh, systems is unfortunately the fact that you know if you're going to hold your hand out here like all day, you're going to get really tired, right? If you just try that for a little while, you, I mean you can't really make it past five minutes, and so. These are some of the, the, the real issues that come up with these kinds of interfaces. Now, it, it's fun also to note that with, with the system like Touchlight, the reason why the, the screen is transparent is completely different than why they made the screen transparent in the movie. Right? They made the screen transparent in the movie, I think, just so they could get cool shots of Tom Cruise interacting with the surface. Whereas with Touchlight, that's actually integral to the way that it works. So the, the similarity is kind of superficial in that way. 
Here's some of the image processing, just a detail. Um, so you have these, these images, uh, these sort of uh, black and white images uh, that are infrared. And um, you notice there's all sorts of um, what's called um, barrel distortion or, or radial distortion in the image because we're using very high um, wide angle images, um, wide angle lenses on the cameras. And so you can you flatten that out. Um, you bring out the corners, so now you're in, in display coordinates. Um, and you combine them. And right now, the combination is just um, a no number of ways to do this, uh, this combination step. Um, some of you maybe have seen stereo um, systems. And you have a couple of really amazing ones upstairs, multiple camera systems. Um, and this one is just very simple. All we're doing is multiplying the images. So if it's bright in both cameras, in both spots, you see something on the surface. And obviously, you can do much better than that. There's just some views. Um, you can do a little bit better with. Um, Edge maps. So instead of actually just ma matching blobs of blobs against blobs, you actually match uh, edges against edges. And here you're just going to have to take my word for it. This, so this is one of the views that it gets. And you'll this um, you'll take my word for the fact that this is uh, off the surface um, a couple of inches, and while this piece of paper is on the surface, and you'll see that uh, the, the two uh, images of this that one page don't match up, and so you don't get any response in the in this product image. So in this one, we have the hand is flat on the surface. And in this, this hand is actually cupped over the surface. So, um, so it's kind of like a touch screen, only it's, you're getting an image back. And, right, and so you can do a lot of um, things like you know, put marks on, on objects. And we've seen some of these things before. Uh, visual barcode kind of things, uh, augmented reality kinds of um, things where you know, if I have a, a book or something that's marked and I put it up against the, the glass, it might pop up the web page for that, for that book. The document scanning uh, is something that we've been, we're continuing to play with a little bit, the idea that I can have some part of my desk surface or whatever that, that brings in, uh, quickly brings in real paper, um, uh, uh, you know, image data from real papers. Um, We've done a little bit of work with an infrared stylus, and the idea is that, um, you know, if I have a stylus and I'm, well, this is a little bit big, but you know, I have this idea that I can be pointing at something over here at the display, and if I actually want to make a, a fine annotation, you can transition seamlessly um, to this this mode of actually drawing on the surface directly using the very same system. It, having two cameras is interesting because I can now track this thing in in 3D, right? I can I can see all the way through. The surface, and so I can track basically anything in the room that's on the other side of that glass. So, yeah, so off the surface, um, we can do things potentially. Now, we haven't done this stuff um, uh, particularly well at, at this point. The idea that because we can see through it, we can do run processes like face recognition tasks. So, imagine a display that you walk up to it, you look into it, it recognizes you right away, and maybe it logs you in. Or maybe it notices you're actually with someone. It still sees, it still recognizes you, but it sees that you're with someone. So it doesn't, it's what only brings up the documents that you consider as public, or semi-public, or however, you, however you see it. Um, other kinds of things that might be kind of fun to look at is are uh, actually recovering the gaze of the of the person, so that you can have a, um, you know, sort of a, um, uh, a fake spatial display, and and the, so that you, if you look at an object and then look over here, the object, you know, the the object is rendered at the correct viewpoint. So it really, the, the idea is that you can bring in any sort of the perceptual user interface uh, work that, you've, that maybe you've, you've seen over the years, these kinds of things. That all these things are at play. But there are some interesting advantages of having the sensing right at the surface. Right? If you think about it, you've probably seen other systems where you have a camera over here and a camera over here, and you're doing something, you're waving your arms or whatever. Um, so you, you know, if, you, if you had a display and you have a camera here and then a camera here, well, you get some coverage out here for sure. Uh, but a lot of the, the, the systems that we've seen out here have trouble with this space, which is kind of, an, I would argue, is, is a really interesting space to do um, certain kinds of interaction, right? It's, it's really hover space. Right? On a tablet PC, you have this notion of hover. So if you have your stylus on there, and it's actually integral to the, the way the tablet works, the idea that I can actually see where the cursor is and not, and not quite be touching the, the surface of the tablet PC. So with this kind of system, you could potentially get um, a, you know amazing hover, and so actually, so one idea would be you're actually touching the object that you want to interact with, and then interacting with the object out here in space and sort of doing a 3D manipulation. And so I think this is 
this is also an area of future work. So um, yeah, this kind of summarizes some of the things I just went over. Another interesting idea is this, this notion of eye-to-eye -eye video conferencing. Right? And this was something that actually Hiroshi Ishii did a little bit of work, um, well, a lot of work actually, with his clear board um, system. And, and the idea is simply that um, in most video conferencing systems, you have this issue, like if I have a camera here and then I, I see you over here, well, I can never quite look you straight in the eye, right? If I look at the camera, well, I'm not seeing you, right? So there's this kind of funny disconnect. It that, that can be kind of disturbing when, you're, when you first use these kinds of systems. I think people can get used to it pr fairly quickly. But in this system, we, could, we can talk about actually putting the, 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 the presentation of the, the person you're communicating with between your eye and the camera. So as you move, move around, the, the presentation slews over so that it's always on, a, on the ray between the camera and the eye. And so you're always looking right, in the, right into the eyes of the, the person you're communicating with. Now that's a single user experience. It doesn't extend to multiple people. But. Is it hard to do that, like a, like a old style teleprompter? I mean, are there problems involved with just using a piece of glass and putting a camera behind it? You can definitely do that. And, and, and Hiroshi really um, explored that. Um, so it's, you can definitely do that kind of stuff. And I would say one of, the, one of the drawbacks is simply just the volume of the, it's a much bigger, more elaborate kind of thing. And you, you certainly don't have the sort of aspect of it being a touch display as well. Um, yes, and let's see what, yeah, and I think there might also be some, some trouble with where sort of the presentation actually sits. Um, in the systems that I've seen, you have this, um, you're looking at sort of the virtual image, right? And so it's kind of, well, I guess it would, it would probably work. It's, it's different. Um, yeah. So the camera's not interfered with the image the camera is recording? Does not view the image that's being depicted? So, right. So in most of the interaction stuff I've seen, that's a really good point. Um, I'm mostly sticking to um, infrared. Uh, precisely so that I don't see what's being projected. Now, it just so happens that, that this um, screen material, um, there is a certain amount of light that's actually reflected back. It is not a completely efficient and an efficient device from that standpoint. Right? And so you do have a little bit of interaction in that, in that. But it's actually, it's not, in the experiments that I've done so far, it hasn't been a, so much of a problem. It can be for certain kinds of viewing circumstances. Have an IR luminance behind the screen. Um, I was just wondering, like, if you've looked at the safety levels of the IR, how long, how much IR you need. Or yeah, I, I keep IR. asking a lot of people that same question, and I always get funny answers. On the one hand, there, there are people who say, "Well, it's, it's certainly no worse than if you were to like walk outside." I mean, the, the, the amount of power here is nothing compared to the sun, mm -hmm. even reflecting off like a parking lot or a sidewalk or whatever. Uh, you know, one of the concerns there is that, well, in that situation, when I walk outside, I have my ret you know, my iris actually closes down. So, you know, there's this danger. Most of the people that I've talked to will say that if, unless you're, if you are diffusing the um, infrared a little bit, like it, it should, it should never be a problem. And actually, I think in the levels that we're talking about, it's just really not that much. I mean, we're talking about a watt or something like this. It's, it's just not a lot of power. It'll depolarize the visible light so that you can't do uh, stereo using polarization. That's a good question. I think it probably will. I haven't tried it. Uh, my intern this, this season really wants to do it. But uh, yeah, it's a good question. I don't think it's going to work. <coughs> um, so I get this question, what's the killer app of these kinds? Of, this is not, obviously, touch light's not the only kind of um, system like this, so the smart board and all these, there are things you can buy these days that kind of do um, um, things a little bit like this already. And what is the real killer app? I get this question a lot. And, and my, my retort these days is, you know, what is the killer app of the whiteboard, right? Most of you have like a, you know, like a $3,000 supercomputer under your desk and then you still have a, you know, $100 whiteboard right next to it. I think that's really interesting, right? The fact that we, you know, these, these kinds of displays are really useful for, um, uh, two or three people around them, interacting with them. The, the idea to manipulate things directly, annotate things, um, just um, 
uh, and that's so you know a lot of people frame this question. I mean, this may be something that's more common in the commercial world, but we do get a lot of I do get a lot of questions like, well, what is this really good for? And I think that we need to get out of this mindset a little bit of always trying to find that one killer application, in the sense that in the same sense that a whiteboard is generically useful. It's something we need, something that's we can walk up and use in, in interesting ways. So that's, um, and I'm going to move on to a couple of other projects. And this is something I did more recently, and it's it's kind of similar. You'll see a lot of uh, similarities. Um, it's more of a system for um, a uh, tabletop rather than a wall. But that you know, you might say that's kind of a superficial distinction in some ways, but in other ways, it's it's not. So the idea is to have a a little pod that you set down on the desk and it actually transforms the, the desktop surface into an interactive display. So this is a, that same projector I was using except just turned uh, 90 degrees and a single camera now instead of two cameras. And we have this, um, these kinds of cute little vision things that you can do with uh, you know, bouncing a ball around which is you know, amazingly fun actually. And um, just illustrates sort of the, the um, just really uh, the, the simplest kind of interaction that you can do. These are little um, plastic pieces that have a barcode printed on them just with a laser printer. Um, nothing terribly special about that, but you can imagine this uh, being uh, like a game piece in, a, um, in some sort of um, game or maybe a knob that you set down or URL or search term, whatnot. That's a piece of paper you just set down and as I move, it tracks that piece of paper and as you move it around it warps the video. Um, to that piece of paper. So there's nothing, you know, tight shot of the tag that shows you what that looks like. Here's a, um, what the camera sees. And one of the things I've been playing around with is this idea of, well, you know, how do you, um, like one of, the, one of the, the neat things about Play Anywhere is the fact that they're really making very few assumptions about the surface itself. Like there's no touch function, there's no circuitry in the, in the desk. And so how are you going to detect when you're touching the surface? Uh, you'd still like to be able to have that. Um, and so what, what I've been playing around with recently is the, the idea that of looking at shadows, right? So as I bring my hand closer to the surface, um, the shadow of my hand and the image of my hand come together at the surface. And so there's kind of a natural algorithm um, for figuring out touch based on that, that property. Uh, here's what. What's the primary source of that very short lag? Is that the capture of the video or the processing of the video? It's, um, there's a lot of different sources for the lag. Um, there's also the fact that the projector and the video card are actually on different clocks. That's the one that I can never sort of do anything about. Most of the time, like, the answer is to just get a faster sensor and not worry about um, too much else. Um, because the, this system does run at a, at a fairly solid 30 hertz. And so you are um, um, probably at least a 30th of a second behind, but that doesn't entirely explain the lag. There are other things going on. How much is uh, the light control? So the light, um, you can't see it here in this little um, sketch, but there's, a, there's an infrared light source um, right here. Right. right? So, so I am controlling the light. That, that the whole um, business with the shadows really depends on having a controlled infrared, right? I need to know where that is so that that's, that works. Here's uh, manipulating a map. This is you know ripped straight out of the other. Right. So that's the visible light. Um, visible light shadows. The yeah. The interesting thing about the the shadows. Some people get really worked up with these kinds of systems because of the fact that you're oh well, you're, goodness you're occluding the thing that you're projecting with your hand. And with other systems where you have a top-down arrangement, like the projector in the ceiling, yes, you know, if I look over here, um, I'm going to be occluding the, the presentation with my head. And the one neat thing about about this projector, this particular projector, is that you actually don't have nearly as much of that. I can, you know, I can lean way over the system, and it doesn't. I mean, obviously, it doesn't. It's not a problem there. Um, you can do that. Yeah, you can project from below. Um, you're not going to. Um, have the shadows, obviously, and then other things are a little bit harder, but yeah. You're saying shadows are coming from a separate light source in the projector. The, that's right. 
Yeah, but you need to. Make it stay up there. It could stay up there. That's a good point. Does it work? Does it work? It's mm -hmm. a transparent. Think about that. Yeah, it it also depends how transparent it is. Well, no, the shadows are going to be sharp at the, at the base. I have to think about that a little bit. Let's keep moving. I have still have more stuff. Um, the the manipulation of the of the the map here is based on computing optical flow. So there's no hand tracking or um, finger tracking in that little vignette. Let's see if I can actually get back here. So some people have called this the lunchbox interactive vision system because the idea is that you would actually put the computation um, directly into this box, put a handle on it, and you know it's about the size of a lunchbox, so you could set it anywhere. And there's really no calibration to speak of because as long as the system is sitting on the surface uh, that it's projecting onto, then this, this calibration, this setup of this camera in correspondence with the projection itself is something that's done exactly once. Like I, I, obviously, I can pick this up and put it on another plane, and I don't need to recalibrate it. And so these are the kinds of issues that are really important, say, if you're thinking about a, a slightly more consumer-grade version of some of the other things you, you may have seen. Right, so right, you have this um, a lot of systems out there, um, you know, um, here, you know, built here and at, the, at MIT and so forth. Um, you have this um, the projector in the ceiling, and you have this this problem that actually, you know, one of the biggest problems if you were to do it here in, in a lot of other places is the vi the vibrations in the building actually come out into the projection. That's kind of a surprising problem. I don't know if you guys have noticed that, but it's not easily moved. It's something you actually have to call somebody to move, and that's a huge huge hassle. Um, and then there's the, the projector and um, camera in a box kind of approach. Um, and, that's, and that's a nice uh, system because everything's more or less controlled in the device. It's self-contained. But then you know, if you think about it from a product perspective, you're, you're now all of a sudden in the business of making furniture. And you know, it's something that you can't you know, get into your SUV at Walmart. Right? And so that's just kind of an issue. A lot of different examples of that, including uh, uh, Scott's uh, Designer's Outposts and the Hollow Wall, Perceptive Workbench, Metadeath, lots of different things like this. And then, you know, sort of to a certain extent, planning where it's just merely just taking a lot of that sort of stuff and just um, um, putting it off to the side. So, um, let's see, I think I'm going to skip through some of this, right? I think um, a lot of the little interactions in the video, they don't really approach a real application, but they demonstrate some of the capabilities of these kinds of systems. Um, and so it's just kind of a, some of the things are just little toy box examples. Um, there's some, there's some, de de uh, some details on the, how the shadow-based touch algorithm works. We're basically looking at um, how the shape of the shadow changes. So it goes, you know, this is one way to do it. You just look at, um, instead of trying to recover the actual um, depth or the height of the hand above the surface. You can just look for uh, the change in the shape of the shadow. It turn, turns from a uh, sort of this blunt uh, shadow into a pointy shadow. There are obviously other ways to do this, but this is the way, way I'm doing it now, which seems to work pretty well. Um, the, the page tracking stuff is kind of interesting to talk about. Basically, you have um, everything is, is done in uh, using edge maps. And so you, you take the, the spatial derivative of the image um, using these kernels, and this is something that, that um, the sort of basic image processing kind of thing that you can do. And you can actually compute the orientation of the edge by looking at the, the arc tangent of these gradients. Andy, can you get OpenCV to do this for you? No, you're I wrote all, all this stuff myself, yeah. Uh, you, could, well, you could use OpenCV. Well, what's the trade-off there of, of, of roll your own versus OpenCV? So in my experience, you can do a little bit better um, in terms of speed if you roll your own. Um, like they're just, um, you know, I think, I think from actually a, from a point of view of teaching, teaching oneself how, you know, the pros and cons of these algorithms, you actually learn a lot more by doing it yourself. Whereas, you know, like the whole business of figuring out these orientations and that sort of thing is, is, this, is the kind of thing that pops out when you're, when you're working with this and implementing your own. Visual Studio? DirectX. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, this, this uses Direct3D, yeah. And there's some, some parts of it that I've been playing around with um, um, writing in uh, as shaders, pixel shaders. 
I'm not going to talk about that, but that, that can make some sense sometimes. Um, there's actually a, in, the, in the, this tag format, which I, yeah, there's an illustration of that. It's actually one of the reasons this tag format is the way it is, is um, it's something that's completely amenable to a GPU computation. So you can write a pixel shader that does these. I probably won't go into that. I don't think we have time. But the page tracking thing is kind of interesting. So you, you get these um, edges. And so at each pixel location in the image, you have um, this sort of um, row theta representation. So you have a magnitude of the edge and then an angle. Uh, and then you move to row theta for that pixel. And then you actually take a histogram over this space and you get these blobs. So each one of these blobs corresponds to uh, one, of the, one of these four lines. And so actually finding a, a page in the image, like a, a rectangle, no matter its orientation, is just a matter of, of finding its, um, this, uh, these um, bright points, these peaks, in, a, um, in this alternative uh, representation. So this is called the Huff transform. It's also another, another basic image processing thing, a little bit more of a computer vision thing. Um, but it's, it's a lot easier now to, to take this image and detect peaks, right? That's a, that's a much easier thing to do than to go find lines. And so, um, so you look for uh, peaks that happen to, to be um, eight and a half inches uh, apart and, and in this pair and then 11 um, inches apart in that and then 90 degrees away, and that is your page. So that's how you track an eight and a half by 11 thing. That's kind of a little detail. Um, so, I'm going to see we're running a little late on some stuff. Um, okay. So, th this little vignette of having the, the um, being able to grab onto the object um, is something I've thought a little bit about and, you know, ro um, rotating it. All right, so think about um, uh, the last time you used a drawing package when, when you, we already touched on this a little bit. Last time you used a drawing package to rotate an object, you would have to you know, click it and find the little rotation handle or whatever and sort of get into this mode where you're taking the, the movement of the mouse and rotating it, right? Whereas you're not doing this kind of natural thing where you're actually grabbing onto the object and rotating. You just can't get that from a mouse, right? So what does a mouse do? Well, it takes all the kinds of different interactions you can do and reduces it to a 2D point. Right, the, the whole richness of human motion and expression down to a 2D point, two numbers. So, um, so that's obviously, we can, we can do better than that with these kinds of interfaces. This, um, the idea that we can um, grab onto something and manipulate it, well, and then, uh, kind of an initial, an initial pass of this kind of problem might be, well, let's find the fingers, let's find the hands and do some sort of transformation on the position of the fingers and the hands. And that's a fine way to, to proceed at first, but what you'll find is that oftentimes it's actually very difficult to make that kind of thing robust because we actually have the opposite problem. Instead of starting with just a one 2D point, we now have a whole image of observations. And you have to make sense of this, of this image. And by the way, just because you put a hand, your hand down doesn't necessarily mean that there's a distinct hand-shaped blob there. There could be many different observations, many different objects. Things are happening all of the time. Things are breaking, you know, objects are, are being formed, they're being broken all of the time in these kinds of systems. So there's a robustness problem. And you know, part of the problem is that we, we're, so, we're so in this mindset of using, of going to this cursor model that sometimes it's actually really difficult to sort of drag yourself out of that and think in a, in a slightly different way. And so what I've done here with this is, is using, um, using just optical flow techniques, just taking these, this, this flow field Right, this is a little bit like, optical flow is a little bit like what MPEG does when it encodes video, right? It just takes little blocks of, of the image and figures out where, lies that, where that block lies in the next image, right? So you get a little, little velocity vector. And if you compute that over the entire image, you get a flow field. Well, you can do all sorts of interesting things with flow fields. Yeah, you can see that. Um, so this is what a, what a translation of a hand looks like under a camera. This is what a rotation of a hand looks like, and here's scaling. And so you notice with the rotation, you know, that they kind of lie along these little radial patterns. Yeah, there are a couple of like outliers here. You know, these guys don't really know what they're doing. Um, and then in scaling, the, there's like a there's like a point out from which these these guys are seem to be radiating. Right. And so the this this um, 
this business of moving the map is simply just uh, taking this flow field and computing the rotation, translation, and scaling in a least squares sense, um, the best single rotation, translation, and scaling operation that, that models that motion. And the beautiful thing about this is that the, I can rotate an object by going like this. I can do it like this. And the system has no idea the difference. I never, I never had to program that. It knows nothing about hands or fingers. Right? And so it's kind of a cute little, a cute little um, trick. And it certainly made this, kind of the, this part of the system easier to build. So um, we played around with, uh, um, and this is some stuff we did last year, um, of hooking this up to Microsoft's Virtual Earth web service. And so you get this very natural interaction of you know, zooming and panning and that sort of thing. Now the problem with, with uh, optical flow is that because you're only looking at little bits of local motion, little bits of relative motion, that if I do this you know, enough times, like I won't get back to where I started. Right? There's a little bit of residual um, error that accumulates over time. But it's the kind of thing you don't really notice um, as a user too much because you're, you're also doing this sort of clutching operation picking your hands up, moving, going down. I'm just curious, in terms of the, because when you're using a map, the fact that the um, mapping is irregular doesn't, no, you don't notice. You adjust your speed of your hand to match what you see in the cursor. When you're looking at paper, you have the feeling that if you move a certain yeah, distance direction, it stays right with you. Yeah, with this, with this app in particular, I found that um, you can get away with um, translating a lot faster than your hands move. But rotation doesn't make too much sense to me. Like just anecdotally, my personal experience, like it's hard for me to. But the, the, the feeling when you're using it that it's staying with you? Or that you're sort of it, in you the video that I just showed you, yes. Yeah, yeah, that you get this sort of, this impression that it's, that it's right with you. Um, and I can imagine that for non-expert users that, that might be important. Uh, for other people that have a sense of how the control scheme works and when you accelerate, the, that would make sense you know, for, for experts. Right? Being able to zoom off to a particular, um, you know, have the, the magnet, just you know, almost exactly like the way the mouse cursor has this acceleration profile might be interesting to do the same thing here. I haven't studied it though, I think it's a great thing to look at. Have you had a chance to guinea pig on non-expert users? Yes, yeah, a lot of chances actually. And, and you know, this is the kind of thing that you know, people just grok, right? I mean, it's not a, you, you, you've known how to do this since you were, you know, six months old. Um, you know, so um, thinking about touch light and, and play anywhere more generally, um, just to move up a little, a little bit here, um, right, the projection, using projection, right, is the kind of thing that's kind of affordable, you know, might be affordable very soon in an actual real product, right? The sensing aspect of it, I, I would argue, is still research in progress. Like, not, not everything's been, been solved. I'm not claiming play anywhere is like the end of the story. Um, the thing that, that's also really interesting from a research perspective is really just what is the interaction design? Like, it's remarkable. Um, like, when, you, when I've shown this system to, to um, you know, people that are savvy about developing Windows applications, they're, there's a real, um, they're intrigued and they, they want to do things for these kinds of systems, but they don't. <laughs> you know, because you're sort of completely trashing the, the, the current model of, the, of interaction, like they don't know exactly what to do, right? And, and for certain kinds of things, it really makes sense to do this kind of thing to manipulate a map. But for other kinds of data, it doesn't make any sense at all. And so there's just a lot of work that needs to be done. Right now, in, 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 this, in the GUI kinds of interactions, we have this very nice sort of point input and rectangle, uh, rectangular targets. And all of Windows is based on you know, point rectangle hit testing, right? So there, there are definitely things that, as a developer, there are things you know you know, right? There's just no question about what's going on. And so, so I think that, you know, I, I think the sensing kind of stuff, I think we're gonna continue to make progress on that and sort of fits and starts. And the, the projection and display technology is, is gonna be pushed along by other, other, um, other needs, like your home theater, whatnot. But the interaction design, I think, is the kind of thing that, that we really need to spend a lot, of, a lot more time. And the, the other thing that's kind of interesting, I don't want to spend too much time on it, but um, I'd love to later. Um, we, um, as a field, we're, we're definitely in the mode of, of building demos and, and showing these kinds of technologies. And we're having a lot of fun building these kinds of systems. But 
we still don't have really great answers for like what is it what is it really good for and i'm not talking about what is the killer app i'm talking about what is the real value of being able to put your your hands on a physical object on a tangible piece and being able to move it around like you know in the literature in fact there there are very few studies that really look at um uh, the value of, of having a real thing that you can manipulate versus uh, having a mouse and widget kind of system. And so I think that's a, an interesting um, question. So let's see, I have a, I have a bunch of other stuff, um, kind of random goodies that I can show. This is, um, this is some new stuff that we did um, recently. So the idea is we... Um, so I, that's a camera phone. I took a couple pictures with it, um, Bluetooth-enabled camera phone. And I put the, the phone on the surface, and, and photos fly out of it. That's kind of cool, right? So, so instead of futzing with Bluetooth, you know, maddening pairing connection, oh, is it connected or, or is it not kind of quagmire, um, things are connected by, by virtue of you having put it on the surface. And the way that works is um, I'm going to stop the video is the system first notices there's there's an an, an approximately phone shaped object like every, and this it, at the moment here all it really understands is the ellipses so it just looks at for you know an ellipse it's about the right size for a phone so on that phone so if you have a phone and I have a phone we're both running this this little program that that um, the desk system can actually talk to Right, so when it when the system sees that there's an, 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 this this kind of ellipse of about the right size, it actually uh, gets on the Bluetooth, opens a connection to each one of the um, the phones, each one of the Bluetooth phones that it can hear. Um, does that phone offer this particular service good that that we advertise for our little app? If so, it connects, it for, you know, goes into the next stage where it actually asks uh, each phone in turn to blink its infrared port. Like a lot of these phones have IRDA ports, right? Kind of useless these days, but they're still here. And this little thing here. Um, so, um, so if we go back just a little bit um, in this video, you can catch it. You can catch this um, little interaction happening. So it first sees that there's a, a, a phone-shaped object right there, and then there's this connection that happens in the background, and this infrared port is blinking. So couple of things are, uh, that happen there. One is that the, the desk system concludes, oh, yes, well, of all the phones that I can talk to in the, in the, in the Bluetooth neighborhood, um, I, just can, I, just talk, I know that I'm talking to the one that's on the desk, right? Because there's this sort of visual handshaking that happens. So it's not the phone that's in my pocket, you know, which you know, probably blinked this infrared port as well at some point. It's the phone that's on the desk. And it also, by the way, tells it, the orientation of the phone, because it maybe knows a little bit about the phone, right? So it knows it's pointed this way instead of the other way. And so that's kind of an interesting uh, little little thing you can do. I think you know I think this um, the idea of of putting um, a device on the surface and, and and knowing that it's connected because you place it on the surface is really um, a very powerful one. You can imagine that, that if you have a phone and I have a phone, if we want to exchange photos or contact information and whatnot, we both put our phones down on the surface. You know, maybe we're even on a public system that we don't even trust. And so there's some sort of encry encryption that's happening in the background. We just, we both connect by putting our, our phones on the surface and we drag the contact information back and forth of the photos, whatnot. And then when we're done or one of us wants to disconnect, we just merely pick our phone up and walk away. So that's kind of neat, and in general, this this kind of um, right. So there's this uh, idea that that any in all devices that are on the surface are connected in some way by virtue of the fact that they're on the surface, right? So if I have a a keyboard and I scooch it up next to my phone, and you know maybe the, the it actually automatically connects the the keyboard to the phone so that I can type to the phone. And if I want to connect to, connect the keyboard to some other device, I move it over to that device. So these kinds, there are all sorts of games you can play in this, you know, once you've got this kind of stuff going. So there's that, that aspect of it, but there's also the idea that, you know, here I am, you know, I'm in my office, um, you know, a few people around here have very large displays in this, in this um, building. And um, so why would I be interacting with this tiny little display when I'm sitting next to, 
you know, some huge 30 inch display. Why doesn't this thing connect automatically to that so that I can use that, that wonderful display? That's, that's the, the notion of annexing a display. And it's not my idea, and other people have been working on that. But um, so that's another direction to go into the idea that when I put the, the phone down on the surface, the, the actual um, interface spills out onto the surface. And so I get you know, the, the glory of a full multi touch interactive surface. Um, meanwhile, all my storage is on this, this device. Storage and maybe the network connectivity as well. Uh, I'm going to skip some of this other stuff. Oh, yeah, so we've been playing around with, yeah, this is tracking infrared laser pointers. Right? Here's a, here's a trick. You can, um, you know those laser pointers that have, uh, um, they project little shapes, like corny shapes, like hearts and smiley faces and stuff? So take an infrared laser pointer, get those, um, get a couple of those things, and, and put them on your infrared laser pointer. It's not the kind of thing you buy at a store, but you can, you can get them. And um, you can now track the shape of the, um, of the laser pointer in, in 3D and actually get yaw, pitch, and roll. A little bit hard to see here, but the, I have this kind of bar-shaped um, hologram that I'm using uh, with the infrared laser pointer. And so I can actually get the, uh, the position of the laser pointer and the rotation, um, uh, position, position and depth, I should say, and the orientation. Um, here's a, a little thing that we've been playing around with where we actually have um, the same Play Anywhere system, but this is actually on a desk lamp. It's a little hard to see. This is one of these Luxo lamp systems, and here's one of these Mitsubishi LED projectors, like terribly lightweight, um, like an $800 device. It's not terrifically bright, and so you can't really project a large image. So what I'm done here is just took the very same um, demo I showed you earlier and just scaled, made tiny little pieces and tiny little eight and a half by eleven pages, sort of scaled down. Uh, but the idea is that on, if you have this whole thing built into the head of a desk lamp, well, you can just bolt it to your desk and voila, there you are. You've got your your interactive surface. And furthermore, you can move it around. And because it's on a four bar linkage, it's always parallel to the surface, right? And so you're always getting a, about the right um, uh, configuration of camera and projector to get a decent image. Yeah, it's not bad. Yeah, you, I mean, you have to sort of uh, well on the thing a little bit to you know, get the thing tightened down as, as best you can. We recently upgraded this to the, um, another projector that Samsung makes. It's even brighter. This, so this is a nice little example of you know, making little tiny bits of progress to this vision. Um, I think there are other kinds of things you can do when you have this, kind of, this, this thing on a desk lamp. It might be kind of fun. I'll leave that to your imagination. Right, laser projectors are just around the corner. Uh, these are these are kind of things that are related. Here's um, the Canesta device. You can buy this kind of thing, virtual or the yeah, virtual keyboard. This is a static image, by the way. If you've ever seen one of these, this this image never changes. It's actually using a diffraction grating and a and a laser. But it's also an infrared vision system. That's I think it's right here in this device. Um, neat device. I don't think it makes a particular particularly great keyboard. Because you can't feel where the keys are. You have to sort of uh, keep your eye on what's going on. But in, in a lot of ways, Play Anywhere is just a, a, a high-end version of this, this same thing. Laser projectors are interesting because um, not only are they pretty efficient, um, but they're always in focus. Like there are no optics in a laser projector. So if you want to project, uh, you know, do this kind of stuff on an irregularly shaped image or an irregularly shaped surface, a laser projector is a neat idea. Pretty soon, I think we're going to see um, Device, uh, laser projectors that are the ba basically the size of a pack of cigarettes, and so that we're going to uh, there are going to be a lot of neat things you can do with that. You know, mobile devices maybe power is a problem. Power is still a problem. These devices. Are they currently monochrome? Or are they the laser projectors that I've seen um, are uh, full color. Yeah, they have a red, green, and blue lasers. And the reason why you don't have them today is that one of those three is difficult. Like there's a certain part of the color space that they're having trouble with. And so each one, each of the lasers uses, um, each of the colors uses a different laser technology. And so it's a little complex. Also, then you got to get no focus, you have to line up the objects. Well, they have to be, uh, they have to share the same optical axis. Yeah. 
That's right. Right. Yeah, I wouldn't take this diagram too literally. This this looks like a single laser. It's probably much more complicated with the RGB. But they're close enough together. The laser, each laser is close enough together that it doesn't have to be focused. That's what, that's the main point, right? That's right. Yeah. Yeah, and because it's laser light, it's you know it's always always there. And so it's a it's a scanning technology. It's, it scans a raster and then does this and it you know does that fast enough. Right. They're pretty neat. The only problem with it is is that the you know, the fill factor is, the, is constant, right? So if I, if, I, if I had one powerful enough to shine over on that wall, you would see each raster individually. Whereas if it were I just shined it right here, you wouldn't notice, right? right? So that's the, the one drawback I can think of with the laser. Well, I don't know. I mean, it, maybe. I mean, the fill factor problem seems pretty fundamental to the laser, laser projector. But you know, maybe I don't know. There's there's a lot of work in this space right now. People are definitely like chasing this dream. Um, so I, you know, my my th feeling is that, and I have no special knowledge of this, but my feeling is that in a few years we'll you know we'll see these as kind of like like we see these LED based projectors. They're kind of novelty items, not particularly useful yet, but you can go buy them. And I think we'll probably see that with the laser projector. Here are some other visions of of surface computing, right? Um, I mean, these are these are kind of commonplace at this point. Uh, the idea of a thing that you can pull out, uh, something a little bit like the tablet PC, these kinds of things. You know, these kids have this uh, spatialized audio system that they're using uh, on this table. Um, this kind of uh, thing of having a um, you know you're interacting with a, a handheld projection unit. Um, yeah, so there's a lot of different form factors. I think that we're going to be start we're going to be playing with. So let's see. So I have a little bit more time. Does, do people want to hear more? Or? So I, have, I have one more kind of. Okay. So I have. So this is some stuff I recently presented at WIST um, a couple of weeks ago, and it's a, a little bit different flavor, but I think it it touches on a problem that that um, runs common to a lot of these sensing based systems. So if I have a vision system, right, and I'm tracking my hands, right, I'm tracking my hand, tracking, 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 right, I get, a, I get a 2D point maybe and tracking my hand. Mm, okay, now what do I do? With, how do I click? Do I click by doing this kind of thing? <coughs> how, do I, how do I stop it from tracking my hands? So say I don't want the cursor to move around and things are, I'm triggering all sorts of buttons and things. Like I want to be able to like get rid of it. Well, if it's always tracking my hand, how do I get rid of it, right? So you need this mode. Uh, you need a, some sort of mode switch in the system, but you don't have a thing in your hand like you don't have a wireless uh, doodad with a button on it to switch it on and off, right? This is a vision system. The idea is that that it's completely wireless and untethered. So you're tracking the hands, but how do you drop the thing? And so Bill Buxton um, has this really nice paper where he basically looks at all the whole um, space of input devices. And he makes this note that basically what you have are, is you always have these three states um, in, in interaction. So think about the, the way the mouse works. You know, the fact, that, the fact that you can take your hands off the mouse and nothing happens is actually really kind of basic to, to being a mouse, right? It's an important property. Nothing happens when you take your hand off. So that's this null state. Now when I put my hand on the mouse and then move it around, right, I'm in this uh, what, what Bill calls a tracking state. Um, and then finally, when you put your um, press down on the button, you get this selection. You trigger a selection, and that's clicking the mouse. Right? And so Bill's um, paper on this basically uh, shows that almost without exception, there's one interesting exception, almost without exception, you, you find this, this kind of um, structure in the interaction, this three state. Um, Structure, right? And so the idea is that how do you? So one way to frame the sort of problem of, of how do you get, how do you get rid of it, how do you drop it, is how do you basically reincorporate this kind of interaction into uh, these sensing-based systems? And so if you look for it, you can find these states. Usually, people work out some sort of mechanism. Maybe it's a foot switch. Maybe it's a posed-based thing. Maybe it's speech. Um, there are all sorts of different ways to do this kind of thing. And if you look for it, you can find it. The interesting exception is when you ha are in a direct manipulation framework, right? And that is like a tablet PC or a touchscreen 
when you really only have two states. You have pen up and pen down. Now on the tablet, if you ever use a tablet PC, like it's kind of um, the whole business of how do you get to right click. I mean, there, there are all sorts of things and way, ways to patch it up. But for the most part, you're, you're dealing with just pen up and pen down. And the challenge, of, I mean, you, you run into the minus touch problem when there's no way to, so to speak, put the pen down. Right. Well, in the case of the tablet PC, right, that's, it's really not, maybe it's not pen up and, it's not picking it up physically, it's more like being out of hover state. That's the only thing that matters in the tablet PC. Tablet PC has no way of dis distinguishing when, when I put it down on the desk or when I'm out of hover, hover range. Selection to when it's on the surface. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, and so he has a way to, yeah. You're totally right, and I am wrong. In the tablet <laughs> PC, in the tablet PC, yes, you have this three-state thing, and, and actually, even even in the paper, he talks about this. But in certain kinds of direct manipulation frameworks, like a simple touch screen, where all you're doing is hitting buttons, you have a two-state. Maybe that's what you're getting at. I'm sorry. Well, I also think that you need to be in whether it's an absolute point and a relative point. Yes. It's an absolute point and you're just going directly to the point. That's right. So. Yep. Good point. That's, that's totally true. So, um, so what I'm going to talk about now is um, much smaller than that. And the idea is um, to look at um, a particular state of pinching. Like when you bring your thumb and forefinger together, wouldn't it be nice to be able to detect um, this action, right? And the neat thing about it is that it's this kind of activity, this, this bringing the thumb and forefinger together, or pinching as I call it, um, is unambiguous to the user, right? You, there's really no question as to whether or not you have your thumb and forefinger together, right? So it's a little bit different than sort of like putting your hand in a particular pose. You know, well, um, you can think of all sorts of funny poses you can put your hand in, but um, you know, I challenge you to find something that's as unambiguous as putting you know, actual touch into, the, into the, the pose. And so a discrete signal that is, um, um, this um, bring your thumb and forefinger together maps nicely to a discrete input. That is the, this tra entering the tracking state or the clicking state. Take your pick. Um, and so diagrammatically, this is, this is one way to kind of think about what I just said. And the idea is that on the top graph, you sort of, you have, this is kind of what you want. You're either clicked or you're not clicked. And there's sort of no ambiguity. It's a discrete transition. This is what you have with a mouse by virtue of this micro switch that's embedded in a mouse. The other systems were um, vision-based uh, systems where you, you know, maybe you use a closed, closed hand for one state and then an open hand, and then you, you affect some kind of tra um, threshold to detect when you've moved from one to the other. And um, this is interesting. You have, to, you have to find some way to pick this threshold as a designer, and that's something that it's not always easy. As a user, um, how do I know where that threshold is? I don't have a good conception of where, where that threshold lies, right? So it's like, um, um, you know, it's kind of analogous, I think, to people's uh, conception of, you know, distance and, and these kinds of things are they're not very good, right? Hold your hand above, and if I told you, you only, you only get a click event when you, when you hold your hand two inches above the surface, you're, you're going to be terrible at this. This is, a, this is not something that we're good at. Right, and so, um, so we have this problem that uh, you have this continuous signal that we're trying to quantize. Whereas a pinch state, well, you know, maybe it's not quite as discrete as what we want, but it's significantly more discrete than sort of watching for a change in pose. And in my experience, what you, what you find in these kinds of systems where you're looking for a change in pose is that users tend to exaggerate. Because, it, because they, if they don't know where the, the, the transition change is, you know, they'll go from like this, and then they'll go like this, right? And uh, this is how they work the system, right? They go like, they just do this very exaggerated motion. In fact, I just saw a system the other day that uh, that's exactly what people did. So. Do you think maybe philosophically our designs have been limited to discrete interfaces? Because that's what the interfaces were capable of. And now that we have the capacity for gradual sensation, we can completely revamp the way we interact. Yeah, so it sort of begs the question of whether or not the interactions are modal, since we typically think of modal states as being either in them or not. Right? Is it does it mean you know is it is it meaningful to talk about being half in one mode and half in another mode? Maybe. Quantum interaction. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And so, 
Um, I mean, if you're not in a mode, then it, yeah, you're right. You're, like it's, you're, it's more about transducing the motion or the. For example, window focus is, is the one that springs to mind. Now we have the window you've last clicked on, and it's discrete. It's the one that's in front. But in reality, I mean, if you look at the desk, no single one is in focus. They're all in focus. Yeah. It seems that's operational though. It's not because you couldn't do more rates. When you type, you might know which one's gonna which which one's gonna get the keystroke. Which is binary, right? I mean, you don't want to go the key, that that character going after this window and after that window. Yeah, I mean it is it's, it is sort of this funny property of the of the computational systems that we have today that we seem we seem to require these kinds of things, right? Whereas in the real world we might not. Like, can I address like someone halfway in between you and the next guy? I I think it's really interesting. I, I think it's a it's a wonderful point. Um, give it a shot. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, pinching. You can think about pinching in terms of ergonomics, right? We have this this um, these hands, right? And uh, we have you know they're built really. We have these opposable thumbs, and so it's very natural for us to grasp things, and they're natural sort of analogs to, you know, I can sort of mimic um, um, tugging on a piece of fabric or holding a pen, picking up a small object. There's something very basic and, and primal about this motion. And so uh, lots of other people have done this, uh, use this kind of um, signal in interactive work. Uh, these are, um, you can buy these gloves and they actually have little uh, contacts in the, in the fingers to sense when you're, you brought your thumb and forefinger together. If you couple this, say, with a tracking device like a Bohemus or something like this, um, you have a, you know, an interesting system. And so it's a very popular kind of approach in VR if you can tolerate wearing a glove. Um, and, right, and then I'm gonna actually going to introduce a system here where we're looking, we're exploring this kind of concept um, over the keyboard. And so there are other people who have done this kind of work, including some other stuff that we did a long time ago, where what we actually did is we embed a um, uh, capacitive touch sensor where it's handy to affect that mode switch. And then otherwise we use optical flow to move the cursor around. So the recognition problem is something like this when you have a top-down view of, of the hand. Um, so you know, I want to be able to see this transition from an open hand to a closed hand. One way to do that that, that, that most people in computer vision would uh, leap to too early, I would argue, uh, is trying to track uh, fingers. Right, so you track fingers. It seems like you could come up with some algorithm to track fingers. You know, maybe you look at the contour and you look at the points of maximum curvature, uh, these kinds of things, or you look for um, something about the right uh, width or something like this. You know, there are, there are endless number of things you can try to track fingers. And then you, as you as you're tracking the finger, you just notice when they come together, right? I mean, the flaw in this this approach is. You know, is is kind of obvious, right? When you bring your thumb and forefinger together, maybe you don't see a thumb and forefinger anymore because the, you know, you you're not seeing the tips of the finger anymore. They're, they've kind of merged. Don't you think once you've got the perfect angle, they can overlap without actually being touching? Once you're literally just right on that. Yeah, I'm not going to solve that problem, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. So um, the technique that we've been playing around with is, is really simple, and it's kind of a fun little a fun little exercise. Um, so basically, um, what we're doing, instead of looking at, at this as a distinct object, the hand is a distinct object, let's look at the background. Right? But what's, happening, what's happening in the background, right? Uh, here we have a single shape, right? a single connected shape. Um, and then over here, when we bring our thumb and forefinger together, we're actually creating a new shape. Right? So we have two shapes. We have this big outer shape, and then we have this hole that we just formed. Right? So that's an algorithm. Just Count the number of shapes in the image. If I see one shape, the hand is open. If I see two shapes, the hand is closed. Right? So that's kind of your a 20-minute algorithm to detecting this kind of pinching motion. It's a very sort of um, you know we're not we're looking at a feature that's indicative of, of what we're doing, not actually trying to model it so closely that we can't compute what we're interested in. Connected components is kind of the the you know this one of these tools in computer vision that that actually works mostly, um, and basically what you're doing is um, if you think about uh, the pixels of an image as as a connected as a as a graph with with edges, and each um, 
pixel that has the same color as the neighboring pixel is connected, right? You get this kind of graph, and then there's just simple, um, um, you, you know, we can talk about groups of pixels as being connected because they have the same color, and that's a connected component. So here we have one connected component, this white bit, and then this uh, black bit. So this is a very common thing to do in, in computer vision. So what it requires is this image, and then you go to this binarized image, um, this black and white image of, of the hand. And this is, another, this is another classic problem in computer vision where you, you're trying to eliminate the background. You're trying to segment out the, you know, one thing from the other, um, kind of like a green screening effect, background subtraction it's called, typically called. And basically what we've done here is we take a snapshot of the, of the scene without the hand in it, and we store that and we use that and do a, a pixel-wise subtraction, a very simple kind of technique to get this image, and then you, you, you threshold that you threshold that difference and you, you get this kind of binarized image. There's a little bit of noise in there, but it's still good enough to pull out the, this single connected component. So let me show a video of a system that we've put together that exercises this idea a little bit. I call it Taffy, because you have this kind of, oh, well, it'll become clear later. So you have a camera above the keyboard it's a USB camera, and when I, so I'm showing you the, the hand and then also that, that uh, window above um, shows you that, that red blob that's detected as the hole, and then we can support two hands. And we have this very nice clutching motion, right? We can do this, do this kind of thing where you just grab and move, release. This kind of thing. So cursor con control is actually um, better than you might expect. Clicking, right? Back to the whole question of where do you get your modes? Uh, we don't really have three states here. Um, so to do the clicking, we actually just release and then and then uh, pinch really quickly. And then double clicking is like that. We can move windows. Um, not a whole lot. Yeah, it's not clear to me. Incorporate like a, a three-dimensional flashing so that if it, if it has to be in a zone and if you took it out of the zone, then, then involuntary actions wouldn't register or, or vice versa? Well, the whole, the whole point of this work really is to sort of make those, make it so that you don't have to worry about those involuntary actions, right? The, the idea is that putting your thumb and forefinger together is enough. Oh, you, with respect to the accessibility question, yes. Yeah, I'm not. It's not clear to me that that someone who who can't type at a, at a keyboard can do this. That would be that would be my question. But that potentially be a good killer application for this kind of input. It yeah. might. I mean, I'm, specifically, I'm looking at ways to. Um, I'm not so much interested in in emulating the cursor, as you might have noticed. Mm -hmm. um, but more, more so looking at ways to get beyond the 2D cursor input. And so the, this, um, I'm going to go back to, um, right, so the, so the cursor, cursor control is, you know, we have clutching. It's very nice. Uh, this so-called so tap and a half kind of interaction. Uh, close, open, close really quickly in order to do clicking and dragging uh, works but um, you know, t for my money, the, the interesting stuff is this, where you're actually taking the, the ellipsoidal model. You can, you can compute the spatial moments of the whole, get this ellipsoidal model, and then do interesting things with it. So you can obviously translate around, do this kind of stuff to navigate the map. But then you also have the rotation, right? You can rotate the, the, your hand, and you get the, the change in the, the orientation of the ellipse. You can even do this sort of fake um, um, depth, change in depth, but just by looking at the change in the shape or the change in the size of the hole. So it's wondering, like, so we have, like, when we look at a mouse, we have basically broken it down into x and y dimensions, right? So there's just two dimensions. But is there any reason you think something like this cannot be extended to a mouse? If you have an optical mouse, instead of, and especially if you take a wireless mouse, 
instead of moving it just in X and Y, you start to actually rotate the mouse around. Do you think that would... Oh, people have done this, actually, yeah. Okay. Yeah, you can Because you can get optical flow out of that, too, and you, you would also be able to get moments in that. Yep. Um, moments. What do you mean moments? Oh, like when you want to rotate something, yep. right, you could just... Right. Yeah, it's interesting to note that, that uh, yeah, the not optical mouse is just single point flow. Mm -hmm. right. it, it's it's a little correlation engine in there. Probably just as much the mouse as the standard mouse interface. Yeah, from the architecture, do you see that there will be new APIs that will make alternative inputs available to other programs? Standard development. I think if you if you believe the the premise of of the talk, yes. Yeah, you have mm -hmm. to we have to start looking at this question. Um, and I mean, I'm fortunate in, in that where I work, like the that's a that's a fair question, right? I can we can start talking about what are the kinds of platforms to enable bimanual interaction. And uh, there are a number of people in the in the company, like Ken Hinckley and Bill Buxton in particular, that have this huge uh, uh, bimanual inter interaction is a particularly interesting example because we have these people who've done this stuff for for many years. And how can we build in support? For, for that in the, in the platform in meaningful ways. We try tying this into just like the standard raw tools in Office, so you can even. I haven't, but it should work. I mean, via the, the cursor emulation, at, at least. But I'd rather not do it. Do no, that. No. I'm saying, well, no, I don't, I don't mean the standard one. When I'm doing, doing a figure of PowerPoint, if I could make my rectangle bigger by using this kind of operation, as opposed to filling up a little. I haven't tried that. And stuff. Right, I haven't tried that. I would, yeah, it seems like something we should do. Yeah, I may have to wind up writing my own little drawing package, right? This is the thing, yeah. What do you, what do you think the hurdles are to having, like, even just an initial experimental kind of toolkit uh, for vision based gestures? I mean, do you understand it all? Yeah, well, so, um, I mean, I think Scott can speak to this as well, but the, the um, really, it's all about um, getting away from this. This um, well, we have this model right now where you, there, you, there's no um, uncertainty in the system at all, right? As a as a as a developer programmer, you don't question whether or not the mouse is down or up, right? <laughs> you take this as a given, and this, and the mouse is wonderful because you don't, you know, it's a it's a wonderful design because this is not an issue. Right, this sort of uncertainty. Now, in these kinds of systems, you have uncertainty running rampant. I mean, this this is actually this system in particular uh, is neat because there really isn't any uncertainty. I have I haven't told you a couple things, but uh, but for the most part, uh, as 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 these kinds of systems go, this is a fairly binary system and it's very easy to work with. But a lot of other systems, yeah, you have all sorts of robustness issues that you have to deal with. Like it's, it's more akin to say speech recognition, where you have to you know devise all sorts of ways to sort of recover from, from failures, and you know you see where speech recognition has been. So you, I mean, I, what I'm hearing is that you'd have to build that into the any sort of toolkit. You'd have to build in some sort of, like, uncertainty or ways to correct it. So that Absolutely. Somebody would, if you're designing an application, you could have ways, you know, that you could show people what the what the computer is thinking and or what it's thinking. Uh, yeah, that's one approach. Yeah, but you have you have to deal with it somehow. Whether whether or not you you, you reflect it back to the user, that's one idea. Uh, or you you're, you drive it heavily from the context of, of of the interaction. Another idea. I mean, this is a huge topic, right? But yeah, this is. I know. I think these are the kinds of things that that are difficult right now for most people to to handle. Specifically for this last uh, interaction you showed, where. And the more general class of you know interaction where you 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 are not touching anything you, you you know you're you're really just moving your hands in the air and also the display is disconnected right compared to your previous examples it's very different is there is there any evidence that people actually feel comfortable in, in doing that you know because I would see myself a bit you know lost in you know looking somewhere and not touching anything and moving my hands. Uh, did you did you try to test that, or is there any you know evidence in the literature that people relate to it? Yeah. So um, the most exp experience I've had uh, with that is actually the system that we did at MIT, um, where we had um, and you see this elsewhere, where you have the display, 
and you're interacting with, and at MIT was you're interacting with a dog. That this is the alive system. So you're petting the dog, and the dog is over here, right? And there's this crazy disconnect, right, between, um, um, you know, yeah, I'm, what am I doing over here, right? I'm, I'm having to watch my hand as it's rendered on the display, right? So it's not, it, 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 and it's rather, in some ways, it's analogous to the way the mouse works, right? You're not, you're not really looking, you're not really pointing at the spot under the desk with the mouse. See, I, I think you, you said it right. You were petting the dog, so you're touching something. So, so there is one level. No, there's nothing here. There's nothing here. It's right, but you, you touch him, right? So now, suppose you're petting a virtual dog. Oh, no, a virtual dog? Oh, it's not. Yeah, just, I'm, okay. I'm petting space. Like the All right. So, so people so like the can relate to it. So, so what happens is, yeah, you have this problem. It's, it's a little bit like when you first use the mouse. Can you think back to the time when you first used the mouse? Yeah. Yeah, but, but now I have to think about using a mouse that is really not there. I, I, and, that's, and that's where I'm, you know. I if, I give you, if I give you the mode switch, like the ability to let go, I, you know, and I'll say this without any real definitive backup. You know, I haven't tested this kind of scenario yet. But if I give you a robust mode switch that you understand, like putting your thumb and forefinger together, I think that just as you learn how to use the mouse, maybe it took you you know, a couple days to actually learn the, how to use a mouse with it, you know, um, without sort of over controlling it. That, you know, that's a real issue. Um, I would say that if, so if I give you this, this nice mode, I, I think you could pick it up. Yeah, it's like the other person on the green screen. Point to the different cities where we're going to be Not actually pointing to the map. This is a green screen problem. Yeah. yeah. Some people actually refer to it as that. Or Describing here is sort of orthogonal to the actual interaction technique. Right? So, what you've shown here, and especially when I look at this image, there's no reason why this could not actually be two different things as well. Two. It could be two physical objects two that are similar. Yeah. Right? It could be. Yeah, other people have done this. Right, and yeah. so, and they could very well be driven um, using cameras inside them as opposed to having like literally coming top down. Yep. Hands. You can use two mice. Right. So you could use two mice and doing the same thing and having the manual. Right, right. I, I should say part of the motivation of this was to just, um, you know, we, we are thinking about the different kinds of gestures that, get, that can happen over the keyboard. I mean, the, the keyboard is an interesting site for gestures. Why? Because your hands are there. Um, so even though it is kind of a, a, let's say, not exactly beyond the desktop scenario, uh, it is still a very interesting place to think about gesture. And it also happens to be a place where you can do some very subtle kinds of sensing, right? Because you get a nice shot. I, but I completely agree. And, there are, there, and there's lots of work where people have used two pucks uh, yeah, to manipulate. Instead of saying it's a gesture, it's really more of a virtual puck. Yeah. <laughs> oval was a yeah, okay. It just yeah. happens not yeah. to be there, right? Okay. Yeah, that's, I think that's, I like that. Um, I think we have a few more minutes. Um, there, are, there are some limitations to this approach. Um, uh, you, it's really only as robust as the segmentation is. So if, you, if your um, background subtraction algorithm is generating noise or somebody like, you know, if, if you use a really, really simple-minded background subtraction technique, it'll be, uh, it'll freak out when you, somebody opens a window in your office, um, these kinds of things. And that'll break it, obviously. It, it, it'll break the sort of uh, topology trick that it uses. It's dependent on the line of sight. So like what like you mentioned earlier, if, if your hands um, uh, overlap a little bit or you don't have the, the right angle, you might actually notice a little bit of an error. And in fact, when I've shown this to, to other people, sometimes um, you know, they don't quite realize that they have to sort of um, you know, present a hole, so to speak, to the, to the camera. And so they, if they, especially if they don't understand what's going on and there's a camera here and it's sensing that, they may do something um, where they, you cannot see it. Um, it's, not a, it's not really a full three-state interaction model. Um, we talked about that a little bit. Here's an interesting one that's because um, I'm not doing any finger tracking, I actually don't know where the fingers are, of course. And so that's, so I only know where the center of the hole is, right? So if I'm, if I'm in more of an um, absolute position framework, say I took this technique and put it in play anywhere, right? What, 
do I do I want to know where the hand, where the fingers are, or am I happy to know where the hole is? With the shape of the thing, but with the shape of the hole, you can make a very good guess as to where the yeah, fingers are. Or, or yeah, maybe. Yeah. Adjust the psychology of the human to change yeah. their focus, whether they point with their finger. If I, or point. Mm -hmm. right. if I do this with my hand in this position, I sort of think I'm pointing to the center of the hole. Maybe just the subjective sense of what I'm doing. I don't feel like I'm pointing with this finger over here on the edge of the hole. Right. With enough training. Mm -hmm. I think, yeah, I think all this remains to be seen, right? I'm dying to try it, actually. This is no reason why I can't do this very soon. Um, uh, yeah, and, you know, that's about it. I have a bunch of other slides, but I think I've, I, I think that's about it for time. So thank you for your attention, and thanks for all the wonderful questions. You guys are great audience. <laughs> Any other questions, or should we wrap up? Is there any way that we can see the things that are on the rest of those slides? <laughs> I could do it, you know, just, do the, just flash right through this. Well, the other stuff that, that I've been working on is uh, that I'm not going to talk about is we're still working a lot on um, um, inertial measurement devices and how they relate to, to interaction. So accelerometers, magnetometers, and spatial. I mean, it, it's, it falls a little bit outside the realm of what we talked about. Um, yeah, Andy, if folks go to Scholar, I feel most of your stuff is published. That would be a good way to yeah. go to where? Yeah. It, you know, go to Scholar. Oh yeah. Yeah, my, yeah. Papers are all there, and my my website. And so, oh yeah. Here's here's a bonus. So this was a fun little project that uh that we did just for this year. Uh, just yeah, just for the sheer hell of it. Um. Anyway, yeah, you can read. This, this thing of, of doing something and then seeing it in YouTube or, or whatever and, and I didn't I don't I didn't do that somebody else <laughs> did that. what is the material it's just like an opaque glass no it's it's a piece of acrylic and they've uh, applied a, a plastic um, a, uh, one way to think of it is, is, is a kind of hologram the projector is it, it's sort of um, this isn't the surface it, deformation stuff, right? No. No. So the projector is right coming up right there. Wait, so this material actually um, is designed to uh, diffuse light that's coming in at a particular angle in the same sense that a hologram, the way the hol a hologram works. Now, my, my expertise in holography almost ends there. So I'm not going to reflect light from a specific angle. Right, more or less. So, so can you just like get it made for you, or it's a commercial product. You can buy these. 3M or something? Uh, no, it's um, it's a Danish company. They're, they're called DNP, huh. and they, they sell this stuff. It's like specifically for this type of application. No, it's specifically for um, like um, like shoe stores and stuff. <laughs> right. No, but you wanted to see the video, right? Sorry. But it's <coughs> like a hologram, though. It's, it's not changing when you're changing angles, is it, or is it? It's not like a hologram. Think about, it, think about it. It's not a hologram. Think about um, um, it's you can make a hologram in which you're, you're, you're looking at a white sheet of paper from one particular angle, and then all other angles you're looking at nothing, like it's transparent. Think of it that way. If you move, will like the one, angle that you're looking at change? Not me, but if I move the projector, it's, 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 you're looking at, yeah, it's the other way around, right, so. But it's not a hologram of the image you're showing. It's a hologram. Correct. To, to this is not a holographic thing. display. Exactly. That would be mischaracterizing it's not grossly. Right. It's not volumetric. It's not, you know, there's, it, 
In fact, I, I often don't even mention the, the holographic aspect of it because it tends to drag in all this other, I mean, R2-D2, C3P, you know, <laughs> Princess Leia. There's all this craziness. Well, that was 20 years ago where they literally were doing, you know, through and oh, yeah. was, you know, yeah, in uh, 30th of a second all the different angles that it literally got a whole uh, Right, so there, the other place where you see these kinds of displays a little bit like this, and they tend to be called ho uh, holographic optical elements. Yes, where you, you are setting up you know, a, a, a series of projectors that are all projecting on the same surface. And um, right. you know, uh, that's a little different, because right, yeah, you're setting up this a bunch one, of different views. I think they views. just moved a mirror so it would project on the same surface, but yeah, you know, slices in time. Right, so as, as I move, the idea would be as, as I move my eye point, I'm looking at a different projector. Yeah. Right, and so th that's a different, it's related but different to this. This is far simpler, right? So, so how bright it is, like, because you mentioned kind of like, you know, like video conferencing application, do you think is, is, it, is it bright enough for something like that? Does it diffuse enough light? The brightness is, is, is more a function of the projector. Right, but you know, because you still see through, right? So, so you know, how much do you need to illuminate it in order for it to have like, you know, how good does it look like when you're standing there? Well, if, if you, I mean, if you, if that's something that concerns you, you can clearly put it in a box. For these kind of things, do you keep that back half of the room darkened? Or you, you could. I, I, do I, do don't, you know, you don't. I don't. I mean, good enough. It, and there, one thing that I, that, that's kind of fun, and like when I, when I first started playing around with this material, was, it was kind of fun to just um, put like a spinning 3D object on it and watch people's reactions as they, as they walk by because what, what you notice is there's this kind of, um, if you have a cluttered background on a transparent display and then you pop up a 3D object on it, it almost appears to the casual eye that there's something floating in space. Um, I could call it holographic. <laughs> Teleportech that basically sells video conferencing, it doesn't, it's like a teleprompter, a piece of glass at 45 degree angle, and they just pick the image up, Yep. and it sort of appears like there's a person floating there. Right. There's nothing fancy at all about that, so. Well, it, yeah, people just, your brain, your brain accepts it as my only point. So. Right. It seems like the same principle. It is a, uh, the same principle, similar principle. Um, the, in the experiments that I've done with the, um, the video conferencing idea, um, I really did move the, the uh, projection so that it lies, al the, the presentation so that it lies along the, the ray from the camera to me. And that's, that's an added elaboration that I don't think uh, these guys are using, right? Because y you, need, you need to track where the user is, where the eyes are at some course level in order to do that. Now, the reason why I can't show you that video is just that I, I haven't really done anything but just mocking that up in sort of gross manual fashion. But it's, it's better anyway because it would be much closer to the display. I mean, ideally, it would be like a wall, and you'd be able to walk up and put your hand on it. The person at the other end could put their head up against it. And it would so almost like there was a glass window there, right? Yeah, so you should check out, if you're interested in that, you should definitely check out Hiroshi Ishii's uh, okay. um, old work, his, his clearboard system. He spoke here about a year ago, right? Yeah. I bet he didn't talk about clearboard. The clearboard is something he did when he was still in Japan. That's right, he was over here NTT. Like and 10 years. He showed a couple photos of it. But it's a remarkable system, and it, it, it's, it's still like one of these things, when I, when I look at it now, it still seems incredibly modern. Like it was done like a long time ago in, in our, you know, in, in, in our sort of our uh, short time spans. Yeah, and, and, and the ability to have... Um, Can you, um, I think there's some requests to spell that. Is it a teleboard? What is it? Clear, clear, board. clear board. board. And it's an application of these, or it's completely different? No, no, no. It's something that Hiroshi Ishii did. Okay. Along, like, I don't know, it might have been more than 10 years ago. But they meant similar holographic kind of technology, or completely? The idea that you can, so his, so his, um, his, his uh, scenario was exactly this, that you, you're on this display, and he, he did it in kind of a desk format, and you, you're doing uh, some annotation, you know, you're using a grease pencil or something on, on a display, and then you can, um, your partner in the video conference can actually see you doing that, and you see him 
looking at you doing that, I mean, right? The second impression is the two of you are standing on opposite sides of a piece of glass. That's the model. Yeah. There, there are some ways in which his system doesn't quite do that. Because uh, he's, he's, he's actually, um, well, he built two systems, so I have to, I have to speak carefully here. But the, the, the system that I'm familiar with um, is not quite like that. If I go like this with my head, it doesn't do what you would expect. Yeah. Right. Right. Now, you mentioned a minute ago, maybe I missed it earlier. Are you working on something where you're able to actually tell where a person's looking without having any heavy equipment on? I'm not going to make that that claim. I, I would say we're looking at um, at least tracking the face of the person in depth. And it's different than where they're looking. I'm interested in that just in terms of, like, for example, if you're going to do, you know, sort of something in a virtual space, that being able to actually, you know, move around, uh, you know, to be able, like, you know, using a uh, cave or something that you know, been in the cave. Yeah, yeah sure. It's, um, you know, there's something kind of nice to be in essentially a holodeck and you have to track where you're going, but you wear a lot of equipment. It's not that useful for multiple people. So, um, so we are playing around with the notion of, of um, tracking the face mm -hmm. or tracking the head. Mm -hmm. And that, that's something we can definitely do. That's not hard. Yeah. But that's different than tracking where you're looking. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So. Thanks again. Thanks. Thank you. Down. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. For information on other online Stanford seminars and courses, please visit study.stanford.edu. The preceding program is copyrighted by Stanford University. Please visit us at stanford.edu.